just reminding I trying to think when I first met Amy was in um, although we're both in New York was in Southern California at the Miracles Distribution Conference I don't remember what year it was know, five years ago something like that six years ago maybe ten whoa okay uh, time goes by <laughs> and she just came up and, and introduced herself and said she was teaching the course, and uh, also from uh, New York City. Uh, Amy is a Gestalt psychologist. She's also a, an interfaith uh, minister. Uh, as a young child, she had a spontaneous uh, experience of a, what she called her natural self, which I guess we would think of as being free of ego for a while, right? Which is a, a blissful, beautiful, wonderful thing to have it happen, right? When you just there without the ego running the running the show. In 1998, after uh, practicing all 365 lessons from the Course in Miracles, she had another uh, awakening, and she's been teaching ever since. She was in Florida for a while. Uh, now she's living in Southern California, and uh, she's just become a, a really good. She has an article in case you didn't notice in Miracles Magazine every issue. There's an Ask Amy, and we get a lot of good reports about Ask Amy. So here you go. Actually, you don't need this. You've got that. Oh, no, no. I have to turn you on. <laughs> a little lower. Okay, you should be on. <laughs> Am I on? <laughs> okay, okay. Um, hi. <laughs> I'm kicking off my shoes. I have a yoga background, and it feels amazing to have the bare feet on the wooden floor. Uh, I'd like to thank John first, because before I told John who I was in California, I thanked him for being a beautiful teacher and opening my heart and just really being peaceful and calm. You know, John's even, and especially at that time, I found that so helpful to my high-strung nervous system. And I'd also like to thank CRS, Yasko, and Chris, because I also find this atmosphere, this environment, very soothing and peaceful and uh, really embodying grace. And I'd like to say hello to everybody on the internet. <laughs> it's amazing that this is the first live stream class. And also, this is the first class, I think, of John's new 10-month series, A Course in Miracles, summarized, right? Uh, no. But, uh, no? <laughs> we're we're going to be a different topic every time. OK, whatever. Um, I'm just going to hand out pieces of paper so you at home also get something to write on just in case some exercises come about. Um, you might be able to have uh, your phone or something else that you want to make notes on. And if you need uh, pencils or pens, I'm just going to uh, put them here. And why don't you just come up and where you can pass them around. Now, at the risk of um, both agreeing with everything John just said and contradicting everything John just said, um, I'm going to work with you on the level of the body. I'd like you to all open your minds to the fact that the ego did not bring you here. The ego did not walk you in here. Your personal self did not decide, I'm going to go to John Mundy's Course in Miracles class. Your personal identity did not say, hey, I think it's a great idea to read A Course in Miracles. The ego is against all of that. The only thing that has moved you onto this spiritual path and into this room at this time 
is grace. What is grace? It's the Holy Spirit. What is the Holy Spirit? It is the memory of God within you. Everybody has the memory of God within them. That's how I was able to have a few spontaneous awakening experiences as a child. I just disidentified with the person and found myself looking at others with just a sense of <laughs> humor, a sense of humor, you know, what's going on. Uh, that also happened when I was alone a few times. And my experience is that it's nothing unusual. Everybody in this room has had disidentification with personal identity and with the body. Now, I used to think, because I forgot that those childhood experiences happened. I totally forgot. And I used to think that I was one of the ones that never has a, a moment of grace and has never had a spiritual experience, even though teachers would say that Yes, you know, everybody has to. And finally I realized some people have big bang experiences. A Course in Miracles talks about <clears throat> light experiences. You know, some people are having visions. Some people see auras. It's different for different people. Some people are more kinesthetic. They have tingling and feelings. Um, some people hear, you know, uh, Helen Shuckman actually did not hear the inner voice. She said that it appeared in her mind and she took dictation. So even hearing, you know, may not be hearing. Um, okay, so this is typical of me that I lose my thread and I'm like, what was I talking about? Okay, <laughs> what I want you to know is that you've all experienced the Holy Spirit. Have, has anybody here ever um, stared out into space and sort of found yourself trancing. Has that ever happened to anybody? That was a moment when you were free of your ego mind. Has anybody ever had a moment after sex, after your orgasm, where you just felt totally in love with your partner? I realize that's not as common, but... <laughs> but have you ever had that moment where you were just totally relaxed? That was a holy instant. You were free of your personal identity. Did you ever, as a kid, um, you know, spin around in a circle until you fell down on the grass? Has anybody ever done that? That was a holy instant. That was a departure from personal identity. And in fact, the Sufis have a practice. The whirling dervishes spin on purpose, and they have a way of doing that. But, you know, when you do it innocently without having to be taught anything, you already know how to do it. As a little kid, you just play and fall down, and there's no person there in that moment. And there's plenty of other experiences like that, but I just want you to, to be reassured or assured that what is not the person is alive and well all the time. And what is not the person is what brought you here. So when John gave us that quote about taking responsibility for everything that happens, I do think that that is a um, necessary point on the path that we are defenseless, as the Course says, in your defenselessness, your safety lies. To have something terrible happen, like 9-11, and I don't know how many of you were uh, personally affected by that, who lost a loved one, who, who uh, had to walk over the bridge, you know, who had to deal with smelling the smoke. I'm a New Yorker born and bred, even though I live in California now. And, um, and so, you know, I, I was here during that event. And so how, how many people feel that they were profoundly affected by 9-11? Can I just see a, a show of hands? Okay, and regarding 9-11, how many of you feel that in your defenselessness your safety lies? Beautiful, beautiful. And believe me, those of you who don't raise your hand on that, that's perfectly fine. Because all Jesus asks of us is that we be honest. And I've found that the best way to be honest, yes, I can question myself. I can say this bad thing happened and nobody's going to tell me different because people died um, and, and families are grieving and innocent people were affected that, you know, were not involved in any kind of conflict, and yet it happened to them. You know, good things happening to bad people. But at, this, at the same time, 
Thank you. Thank you. Okay, that's great. Thanks for catching me and pointing that out. So I said in reverse because the ego is so good at doing that. You know? Yeah, it happens to all of us. It happens to me. Yeah, bad things happen to good people. Actually, it works in every direction, right? Yeah, it works in every direction. But to process that is something else. So if you know, I still hold a grievance, I'm still grieving, I still have a resentment, that's fine. All you have to do is know it. And if you really believe that you've let everything go, that might not be true either. So we can start on the level of the incident and say, this happened and I made it happen, Yeah, and be willing to take full responsibility. That can be good unless you're feeling guilty about it. If you're feeling guilty about it, it's not working in your favor. It's just enabling the ego. So on a larger scale, I would just say that we've chosen to be unconscious. We've chosen to perceive ourselves as separate. And therefore, every tragic thing that happens, generally speaking, we've chosen it. And we don't really even know what's tragic and what isn't. Because many people say, as John mentioned, having cancer could possibly be the opening into a spiritual life that you never felt before, into a gratitude or an appreciation of life, living it more moment by moment than you ever have before. So we don't know anything. The Course tells us straight up we don't know anything. Now, my path has always somehow integrated movement and yoga. And, and at times, I've been completely disabled and unable to move. But that doesn't actually matter. I'm not telling you, oh, you have to do yoga in order to awaken. No. But the body is going to reveal your unconscious mind. For me, the body is the container that is the symbol of the ego's thought of separation. The Course says it. It says that the body is like a prison and that spirit is limitless. Spirit extends, it just naturally extends. It just overflows with love. And any of you who have ever felt love for a person, a pet, a landscape, anything, you know that feeling of overflowing. Well, that's spirit. That's a suspension from the personal self. And the body serves as a symbol of the ego mind the ego mind prison, the ego mind container. The ego thrives on denial and forgetfulness. But in this sense, the body does not lie. When it's used as the ego, we can track the body to bring ourselves into the present moment. And I see nodding because uh, my training was gestalt psychotherapy and then I got into body-oriented psychotherapy and a colleague of mine is here and he knows. So this is what I'd like you to do right now and jot something down because it will help you sort of keep track. So you think you're in the present moment right now. I mean, you're here in the room, but I'm going to challenge you and say, maybe you're not even present. Even though the body is sitting here, maybe your mind is not here. So let's just see if you can even kind of um, allow, because the person's never going to be able to do this. The problem cannot be solved at the level of the problem. So really what we're doing is allowing the grace that floated you in here somehow, that energetic, timeless, blissful something that's beyond words to drop you down fresh right now. And in this moment, can you write down a short sentence that simply says what you are either thinking or feeling emotionally. Just write, I am and of course you can do this at home. Just write, I am, and fill in the blank. I am feeling, I am thinking.
this is the beginning of the deconstruction of the person, is starting to let the body inform what is being thought, what is being felt. Can anybody share with me what you wrote? Anybody willing to read your sentence? Uh, yes. Microphone. Hi. Here's Rob. I have, um, microphone. Yeah, yeah. And I can also repeat. Um, well, I have an interesting one. Um, we talk, you know, we're talking about what's for 9 11. I'm a first responder, I'm a paramedic instructor, um, been on a job 25 years. And just besides the guys that died, the 343 firefighters and paramedics, there's um, 2,900 people that died. Um, and I'm at a point where um, there's a lot going on listening to you, and I'm trying to mm. just be with it, um, of loss. And there's been 129 other fire department people have died. That's not publicly not being known. Thousands of us are sick. Um, and the sadness, and is the other thing that's going on is that I'm trying to support my coworkers that have tremendous skill. Like I know one that did a mutual at Carl Lillo, a paramedic, and because he did that mutual, my friend Vinny has a lot of guilt, um, tremendous guilt. Mm -hmm. He shoves it down, and he couldn't go to hit a bagpipe some more today. So I went, and um, a lot of, not too many EMTs and firefighters came in the academy, probably more downtown here, but um, there's a lot of guilt. Okay, so let's let's Sinners. stop right there. What's your name? Robert. 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 Dad. Robert. Thank you very Robert. much for sharing. I may go back and forth with you a little bit if that's okay with sure. you. Okay. So if we distill down what Robert said, he's feeling guilt, and what naturally comes up is some story about what this guilt is about. And then he shared some of the thoughts of where the guilt is coming from, and it all makes perfect sense to us, doesn't it? I mean, how can you not feel for that? Now, um, I've been following, the Course led me, I feel that Jesus led me to an embodied guru named Muji. And Muji often says, when he hears a story like this, and I feel this way right now, it's not that I don't care, it's that I don't mind. It's not that I don't care. What you say touches my heart. It's that I don't mind because something larger has, has, is dominating. You know, it's like the ego has a gravitational pull on us. The world is a material world and it's, it's run by the law of gravity, one of the laws. But God, the laws of God, they're magnetic. And ultimately, you know, as you see your friends stuff down guilt, all you can do is, is join him or love. Mm -hmm. And not a human love. You know, something, it may be felt in the human heart, and yet uh, there's something beyond that love. So um, uh, just a tiny example is that many times when I wanted to go to dance class because I love to dance, I found myself going to yoga class. <laughs> and yoga's nice movement, but it's not dancing, and I didn't want to be there. But I was. And so somehow you're in this sphere and you're going to the bagpipes even though that wasn't your plan. Do you feel that you were being moved? I, I've been going for 15 years. I don't know, this may be the last time I'm gonna go mm. to the academy or the service. Yeah. Because um, you know, I went, spoke to my fellow instructors that passed away and, um, and a lot of people that didn't. We, we should have a presence there, but a lot of people just can't deal with it. Um, and don't want to deal with it, or you know, go about their lives, or maybe that they're not working today, so they didn't get paid to go. <laughs> 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 and, and one guy said, "But you're one of the few people besides so and so that didn't go. That wasn't on the clock. Some people were working. You know, yeah. the ceremony's trying to make it happen, and they had army people there." Robert, when the course says, "I don't know," are you a course student? Yes. Okay, so when the course says you are not a body, you are free, for you are still as God created mm -hmm. you. Is is that, uh, does that resonate at all? Does it feel offensive? Um, does it feel relieving? What happens for you with this, this idea that runs through the course, that you are not a body, you are free, for you are still as God created you? I'm, I'm struggling with it. I mean, um, I, I know at this point, so I, I can't get in touch with that. I know I've been spirit-based too. I've had good experiences. Um, but sometimes when you're in the middle of it and you start getting sicker, 
or different things are coming up, then you kind of go, ooh, that's interesting. Yes. Yes, it is. Now, Muji would say, and this is a profound piece of wisdom for me, are you suffering your experience or are you experiencing your suffering? And the difference is that when you're suffering your experience, you're fully identified as a body. You're convinced that life begins and ends right here. But when you're experiencing your suffering, there's more consciousness. You know, John was mentioning unconsciousness and consciousness. And when you gain more consciousness, there begins to come this detachment where you're aware at the human level of the suffering, and yet you're now beginning to operate from, from grace. Grace is just taking over your life. And it doesn't mean you're always happy or that things are always easy, yet there's this kind of ongoing vigilance. The Course talks about vigilance. When you're vigilant for God, it means that you're vigilant against the ego. You're just noticing, oh, that must be the voice of the ego because the ego is telling me there's loss. Now, I mean, it's very powerful. How could we think there's not loss when 2,900 people died? And that's just the beginning of it. There's illness and there's people that haven't even been reported. It's very convincing. And yet the Course is telling us to let that go. And how do we even do that? You can't do it as a person. You have to just allow on the level of the person. There's going to be a lot of feelings, that's all. The feelings aren't the problem. It's paying attention only to those feelings in a way where it's a vicious cycle. So would you, would you mind, do you need to say on your chest? Yeah. Thank you. And everybody else, whatever you're feeling, see if you can locate in your body where this feeling is. And if you find it, put your hand there. Just support the feeling. Just bring some attention to whatever you're feeling right now. Because this will bring you into the present moment. So you're telling us something that happened a little earlier today. Do you feel the anger right now? Um, no, it's happened it was at the site 15 years ago, but I'm just not experiencing it again. Are you feeling, what are you feeling right now, Robert? I, I, I'm probably more aware, trying to be, be more aware, like it's not... You know, maybe it was my ego talking at me. So or... that's a thought. I'd like everybody to just notice that as Robert says that he's feeling more aware, it sounds more like a thought because feeling is located in the body. So see if you could connect feeling with thought. What are you feeling in your body now? Where? Um, my legs were shaking a little bit. Ah, just stay with that. The ego likes to hurry and rush. Holy Spirit slows things down. There's a wealth of healing available in your shaky legs right now. So let your hands hang, yeah, and just, just allow your legs to shake. And I'm sure everybody in this room knows what it's like to tremble and shake, and if you're in public, that that might be embarrassing, and to try and hide it, and what do we do? And you're not doing this now, and it's beautiful to have you stand here vulnerable and open like this. Often, though, what people do is we subtly stiffen, and that's a way of going into denial, and the ego thrives. <laughs> So, um, people don't tend to know the difference between a thought and an emotion and a pure physical sensation. People don't tend to discern between a desire and a need, and a need falls into different categories. There are emotional needs, there are survival needs, there are psychological needs of bonding, <clears throat> that come first are more primal before emotions are felt. I know in my life, um, for my young life, I felt terrified and sometimes angry. Angry that I was terrified all the time. And it was wearing me out. And I was a good girl, I was an obedient kid, and I had a spirit of cooperation. And that anger was a very healthy feeling for me. You, you can sit if you, yeah. Just notice your legs and I might check in with you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Robert. Thank you. That anger that I felt when I found myself terrified on such a regular basis was a healthy anger. 
Just because the Course says anger is never justified doesn't mean that we know what anger really is. So what I'm saying was an angry feeling was more an insistence that I get to be alive, that I don't have to live in a state of fear all the time. You know, that was probably the beginning of my spiritual life in this lifetime. So when the Course says don't judge anything, you don't know anything, you really need to not judge anything. If you can locate a sensation that you might label anger, then allow yourself to not even know. Just follow the pure sensation. Is it rising? Is there heat? Well, what if there is? I mean, if we talk about fire energy, you know, fire can um, warm your hands when you're cold, and fire can burn your body and destroy you. So fire in and of itself is not the problem. And what we might label anger, you can experience it on a purer level. And the more you deconstruct your process as a personality and a body, the more you detach and disidentify from the ego. Could you repeat that again, please? Yes, please repeat that. <laughs> I hope I can repeat that. <laughs> I, basically, what I'm saying is that the more you can track honestly what you are feeling in your body, and you can start with a word like anger, but suspend your judgment and allow yourself to locate the sensation and just describe purely what the physiology, what the physical feelings of the sensation are. Is it pressure? Is it rising? Is it heavy? just very pure, the more compassion you'll start to have for yourself and you will naturally start to detach from personal identity. There will be this natural understanding that pressures and um, tremblings, vibrations and um, energies are intermingled and that they are not personal to you. And you will stop taking yourself so personally, and you will stop being so mortified and humiliated and embarrassed by all sorts of physical things that embarrass us every day. You know, you all know, you know, just like to make a noise, just to burp in public can be mortifying. Uh, you know, but that's what the body's made to do, right? We ingest and then we have to excrete somehow. So. Just being a human moment to moment can be a very embarrassing situation. And the minute you start feeling embarrassed, notice where is that feeling? How is it felt? Are you flushing? Are you turning red? And that is how you identify the voice of the ego. Everybody's saying to me, how do I know? How do I know? Because you feel personally embarrassed. You feel ashamed. You feel like covering up. You're tensing so nobody knows. That's how you know. And then how do you recognize the voice of the Holy Spirit? Because as you keep nailing the ego, this natural relaxation starts to move through you. And you have to find it in yourself. The course is um, customized. Everybody has an individualized curriculum. So in my case, since I was a little girl, people would compliment me on my smile. And that was very nice. You know, It made me feel good as a person. And in recent years, I've come to know that this smile is not personal. First of all, everybody has a smile. Is there anybody in this room who has never smiled? <laughs> everybody is given a smile. And is the smile your lips? Is it your teeth? Is it your jaw? What is the smile? Where is it coming from? It seems like it's of the body. Then a phrase came to me, and it said, find the origin of your smile, and you will find your source. Well, you all have wisdom like that inside of you. You all have something very normal, like a smile, that can suddenly, bam, hit you between the eyes. Because did I do my practice? I was given a practice. Find the origin of your smile, and you will find your source. 
But I was like, oh, that's so amazing. You know, what a miracle that that thought came through me. And no, I didn't for a long time. I didn't try to find the origin of my smile. I didn't do a practice that was handed to me personally. <laughs> and yet, if you do it right now, I'm just going to ask you all, see if you can find the origin of your smile. Don't try. Just allow. Just take a moment. Anybody want to volunteer? Please. Microphone. Oh, mic. Just a mic right there. Thank you. Thank you. Is it up? Yeah. It kind of it kind of feels like a core place deep inside of me that feels this emotion that has to go out. Can you say that again? It's a, I feel like it's a core place inside of me that feels this emotion that has to go out. So this going out, this mm. extending mm. is your natural self. Okay. That's the natural self. It just wants to extend. And a smile is radiant. All throughout the course, we're told you are light. You are loving light. Your function is happiness. You are the light of the world. You are spirit. You are love. And that core place you gestured right about here, you know, mm -hmm. this is the heart. You could talk about not just the physical organ, but obviously there's more to the heart than being an organ. So what is that? That's a memory of God within you. And then what does the heart do? It spreads out. John, I think in your last article, last month's Miracles Magazine, wrote about um, falling in love and how when you're in that state of being in love, you just start to love everybody. All sorts of people in situations that were intolerable before are suddenly like, oh. <laughs> yeah, you hit the sweet spot. What, John? I've got a question. About Please. That. Mike. So what I was thinking was, well, the source of my smile is what I'm thinking. Notice that John started with thinking. See, thinking my thought is thinking. So can you drop into direct experience? Because thinking that your smile is a thought is, um, where does it leave you? Well, what, what I was thinking was it's, it's actually my mind, the right mind, it, rather than the wrong mind, the ego mind. So in what the previous person said, I also feel that, but what has to be expressed is what's in my mind. So I, when I say thinking, I guess I mean it's in my mind. So can you tell me, like, can you talk about that? Yeah, the yeah, keep, keep the mic. So I want you to know that John and I are good friends, and therefore I feel free to give him a hard time. <laughs> it's great, it's great, because it's so common to think something, and then to think about the course, and, you know, right-minded, wrong-minded. So while you're thinking this, where is there any uh, experience in your body, any felt sensation? Well, just bringing up the question, I feel it in my stomach because I'm nervous to okay. speak. Okay, okay. So, yeah, put your hand on your stomach. And can you breathe through this feeling of nervousness in the stomach? And I, I request that all of you uh, take every question as if it's your own and every statement as if it's your own. So who has never had a nervous stomach? You know, feel free to go there. So just breathe through and let's see what happens. We're not trying to change anything. It is a legitimate course of uh, uh, approach to think and then have thinking lead somewhere. But if you're just left thinking, um, it's, it's more an analysis, it's more an intellectual examination. And the course came through intellectuals and used their intellectuality to bypass the ego mind. 
so that they could contact their natural wisdom, which is exactly what happened to Helen while she scribed. And then she would go to Bill and say, I'm a nervous wreck. You know, I don't want to do this anymore. <laughs> and then something in her would just bring her back to scribing. You know, or I think Ken Wapnick used to say that she would shop for shoes all day and then give 20 minutes to meditation, something like that. You know, so that encouraged me a lot because I, <laughs> I'm no better. <laughs> so what's happening now, John? Well, I, my stomach is a little calmer, okay. but it's, I mean, what keeps coming back is that the Course says my body is nothing. It's like a, it's a... It's just a shell. There's nothing there. Okay. So the Course says that your body is nothing. Uh, does this feel like nothing? No. Okay. So you're still experiencing your body. Yeah. You can have the concept the body is nothing and it's useful because it opens up a new playing field. And right now, as you're thinking about this, where else are you feeling something? I don't really mean to put you on the spot because this is a very good demonstration for everybody of how we can't find what we're feeling. And I've worked with many people who couldn't find what they were feeling. And I myself, at my worst, my therapist, because I was doing body-oriented psychotherapy, would um, lay me on my belly and he'd have to move my legs like an infant because I could not access my anger. And he knew that if I could contact this anger that I would start to um, integrate uh, the split off parts of myself that, that were not permitted to protest at conditions in my life that needed protesting. They just did. They would have invited uh, people to behave better if I had the courage to speak and if they could have heard me. Um, he knew I was angry because I was always very irritable when I arrived at his office and had just gotten off the subway. And I just thought it was all the people on the subway. You know, and he would say, but there's something else. It's deeper than that. And we're taught in Gestalt that therapy starts the minute your client steps into the waiting room. You know, don't wait till the words come out of their mouth. So, you know, I was like a car with a dead battery, and he was trying to uh, kickstart my battery. And eventually, uh, I really learned how to express. I was terrified to express. I was afraid I would destroy his office. You know, I mean, I was afraid of the consequences of expressing anger. And also that he would never speak to me again. He'd fire me as a client. He'd go, oh, whoa, I didn't bargain for that, you know. So uh, you really need to be honest with yourself and find out more, find out more, you know, uh, before you think that you might have any idea what's really going on with you. Because in the end, after you get to know yourself, and my path was to really get to know the person and to achieve some things personally, but the outcome, which I wasn't hoping for or expecting and I didn't even know about, was that the person was dissolving. I was noticing nothing's personal. And then eventually I was just guided to spiritual teacher after spiritual teacher. And began remembering, oh, I've always known this. Everybody knows this. What's happening now? I'm just going to sit with it. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. I pinched him. <laughs> Do you forgive me? <laughs> never happened. <laughs> he said it never happened. <laughs> um, I need a time check. I have no idea. When do I go to? 3.30. 3.30? So I have about five more minutes. Okay. Um, one thing I want to remember to tell you guys is the only thing you need to do is be willing. You don't need a lot of time. It might take a lot of time. It may seem that way in the world of time. But in order to awaken, all you need is willingness. And for me, I could boil the course down to, it's a practice of forgiveness that leads to miracles that lead to awakening. And what that means is, forgiving is for giving. It is an undoing process. It is not the human definition of forgiving that we've been using. So I give every thought, every feeling, every desire, every need, every sensation to the Holy Spirit simply by conversationally saying, Holy Spirit, I give you this, um, you know, uh, swirling in my belly, this nervousness. I give it to you. I, I don't want it. I don't believe in it anymore. Help, help remove this belief 
Because the only reason that we're so attached to our identities is belief. Just because we believe something doesn't make it true. And this undoing process through giving, 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 leads to the Holy Spirit's version of uh, material reality, which are miracles. So um, a recent miracle I had, um, this is a little disgusting, but hopefully you'll appreciate it, is that for many, many years I've had a phobia about throwing up. And just about two weeks ago, so I haven't thrown up in about 15 years. That's about how often I throw up. <laughs> And you have to ask, like, how does a person manage not to throw up? Well, there has to be some subtle squeezing internally that just moves everything down because I don't want to lose control and throw up. It's just a control issue, you know. And anybody who thinks that you don't do it, just remember that you learned how to hold in your pee when you were a little kid. When your mother told you, hold it in the first time, how in the world... Did you control your internal musculature? You see, there are things, there are clues about God. Like you don't know how to do, you don't have to know how to do anything. You don't have to know how. Your mother said, hold it in, and you figured it out. <laughs> you know? brought your attention to it. You brought your attention to it. Thank you. All you had to do was bring your attention, but you didn't have to know your anatomy. Yeah. So with the course, too, you don't have to know how. So you give, give, give. And there's this undoing. And then miracles are the manifestation of that. So just about two weeks ago, I felt very sick to my stomach. And I realized, wow, I might need to throw up. But the fear wasn't there anymore. Or let's say there was just a little bit, a little leftover. And I said to the Holy Spirit, I think I might have to throw up. And I'm not feeling that afraid. But... But still, you know, uh, I think I need some help, and I'm willing to flow. I'm willing for anything to happen. Um, I I'm, I'm ready. Like, just do with this body what you will. And so I threw up. I threw up a bunch of times. And I realized something nobody ever told me, and it calmed me down so much. I realized that throwing up is just like a big burp. <laughs> That's all it is. And burping stuff out is a good thing. So that phobia is gone. But it's not like I'm looking to be cured as a person. I consider that a miracle, just a little testament, a little sign that, um, that I'm never alone and that there's nothing to fear. I take it as spiritual confirmation. And what does that lead to? Disidentification with the body. I'm not looking to cure the body. I'm looking to know what I already know. It's very annoying not to know what I already know. <laughs> and you know it too. It's in the word human being. Human being. Being. That's all we are. We are being. When the Course talks about the witness, there's not a, a face in the sky, a witness. There's witnessing. There's awareness. When um, John posted one of the quotes from the psychotherapy pamphlet about recovery, Muji told me that consciousness is in recovery. It has contract, contracted down to identifying as a solitary person. And as we do exercises like the ones I mentioned today, there's an expansion. Consciousness is, is billowing out, like blowing up a balloon in a way, into its natural expansion. Consciousness is recovering from its own contracted state. But consciousness can never not be there. And the Course calls that the spark within you. And it talks about how God is the great light and we are the great rays. And for many of us, we just feel like a teeny tiny spark. And I'm here to tell you that that spark is enough. It's, it's you. You're here now. And the way to find that out is just very logically follow your body, track your body. Give it to the Holy Spirit to use for his purpose. I didn't even read you a quote. I don't think you need it. Uh, oh, last thing. Willingness. Just think of a cell phone. If you don't plug in the cell phone, it will have no power. A lot of people protest that they don't want to turn their will over to God because they won't get to be themselves. But what will happen is that you'll be so much freer and you'll be creative and you'll be useful. 
and your life will never feel more purposeful and free. But you have to have the willingness just to plug, just plug it in. <laughs> okay. So I think that's it. And we'll be back for questions. And thank you very much. A couple of announcements before we get uh, started. Bill, would you like to tell us about your book? Come on. And, okay. This is Reverend Bill Heller. Uh, he's a unity minister. Can I? Thanks, John. Uh, just a brief background. I was introduced to the Course in Miracles in 1990. And about six months after that, some of my newfound friends introduced me to unity. And about a year later, I began reading some of Charles and Myrtle Fillmore's work, some of their teachings, and all I was hearing was the Course in terms of the message of it, the way that, that they were describing, in effect, the distinction between what we refer to as knowledge and perception. They were recognizing that. They're recognizing the presence of the Holy Spirit, enabling us to make the choice that we need. So I was on fire on it, and that was like about 15 years before ultimately I answered the call to the ministry. Throughout that time, I was leading courses and studies of the course, as well as doing work within, chap within chaplaincy and leadership within unity. When I got to ministry school, I found Paul Hasselbeck. For those of you who are familiar with unity, you probably know that name, since he's been the dean of the Spiritual Enrichment and Enlightenment program for, since the 90s. Well, his background was the same as mine. He was introduced to the course, and then shortly after that, he got into, as he learned more about the film wars, he recognized that they were teaching the course in their style, in their manner at that time. So there's been all sorts of emotions, all sorts of issues that have come up over throughout the history between Unity and Course in Miracles, specifically for the Unity community. Was the Course in Miracles here coming in here and going to take over? No, they complement one another. So that's what brought me to the unity ministry as well as my commitment to the course. So I've been working with those, and Paul and I actually, while I was in ministry school, Paul and I, we started this project about eight years ago. Then interspersed between the other projects that we had going on, me being in the ministry, Paul doing his teaching and what have you, it just took us that time to put it together, and I think it was, it was worth it for all of us because it got us a chance to really take a closer look at the fit between the two of them and to see the link that's there. For people within unity, it's an opportunity for them to get a different sense of what The Course in Miracles is telling us and how it fits within um, the, the unity teachings and vice versa. For people within The Course in Miracles, if you've explored unity, or if you have any curiosity about unity, I think you'd be amazed about, as you get into the material and begin re reading about Charles Filmer talking about the distinction between the absolute and the relative. That's between knowledge and perception, as we talk about it. Um, it's been inspiring to me and for many others. That's why you see in so many unity churches our spiritual centers, they are offering the Course in Miracles class because the people who are attracted to unity are also attracted to this as well. And I'd suggest the same going the other direction as well. So we're excited about what's happening, about releasing the book. Uh, and uh, I love John's reference on it, on the back page. He, he finishes it with, with, with the only statement we need to know. After all, the truth is truth. That's at the heart of it. So um, I'll be around afterwards if you'd like to learn more about it or if you'd like to look at the book or pick it up. It's also available on Amazon. And as of this weekend, it's also available on Kindle. Thanks. Thanks, John. OK, Amy, you want to come back up here? And uh, I also a couple other announcements about, uh, obviously, uh, I'm having more guests as time goes by to, to join me. There's so many uh, Course in Miracles teachers out there that I admire and respect. Dove Fishman, uh, Dave Fishman is going to be with me in the near future. And I just want to tell you a little bit about a lady that's going to come next week. It's sort of interesting. You know my 
sideline, but primary interest is really mystical studies. And but the course is the most incredible mystical document that's ever crossed the face of planet Earth because it's trying to get us to that same state that the mystic gets to however they get to it naturally or by accident. Um, I was going to Utica, New York uh, back in April to give a talk at a Unitarian church and a few days before a 19 year old Chinese girl started corresponding with me. She was going to come to the presentation in Utica and I look forward to her coming because of some of that. So she came, she then came to a retreat that I did in Pennsylvania uh, in August. She has had a most incredible mystical experience uh, when she was very, very young, actually as a very small child, and then again at the age of 14. I think it's a perfect sort of description. Uh, this is, she's going to come next time. She's going to come in October. It's only going to take her about 10, 15 minutes to share her experience with us. She's wrote, written it down. But then what I'd like to do is to tell you how this fits into what the Course of Miracles is trying to help us get to. Okay, so that's going. So Amy, come back up here and let's uh, let's talk. Oh, I got to turn you on again. Oh. <laughs> Very easy. <laughs> <laughs> All you got to know is know which button to push. <laughs> All right, so we're going to just dialogue for, uh, for the next half hour or so, okay? And in terms of whatever you would like to talk about, in terms of both what Amy was talking about and what I'm talking keep in mind that our, our basic theme is healing the terrorist within which is what the Course in Miracles is really teaching us to do. The problem is not out there. Uh, that doesn't mean that if a problem presents itself out there that we don't have to address it and maybe do something about it. We don't let people uh, kill other people. We don't let rapists rape, etc. Sometimes we have to we stop that kind of activity uh, and we put such people go to jail because we don't know how to, to really help them because we don't know how to help ourselves. You know, that's, that, that's what the Course is trying to help us to do, is to learn how to stop your own insanity. If you can just learn how to stop your own insanity, keep in mind that the Course, as it says here on the cover, of, well, it's kind of worn off of Amy's book, but it says, uh, this is by the Foundation for Inner Peace. So what we're looking to do here is establish inner peace. I mean, if you've got inner peace, is there really anything else you want? Right? So that even when the world is going crazy around you, you can maintain your equilibrium, you can maintain your inner peace, then it does, you're not going to get pulled off track. You would have to look at somebody like a Jesus or any master as someone who was able to maintain that peace regardless. Uh, having known and worked with Ken Wapnick for a number of years, I think that was one of the things that characterized nothing took Ken's peace away. Right? That didn't mean that he wasn't capable of uh, confronting you, uh, but he did it in the most loving way. <laughs> that you didn't feel as though it was an attack. That was a remarkable talent to be able to do that. Right? Yeah. So, anybody. Uh, we have a mic here. I'm going to have to use a mic too, though. So, Billy, and we got two over here this way, so let's start going back this way. And. Okay, I'll take it first. Okay, go ahead. And I've been Billy, Billy afterwards, okay? Okay. Okay. I wanted to ask you to talk a little bit more about deconstructing your feelings. Put the mic closer to you, Mike. Yeah. Oh, you want to repeat the question? Okay. I wanted to talk a little bit more, or you to talk a little bit more about deconstructing your feelings. Can you say a little bit more about what you're curious about? Or well, need, need to whatever. Know? It's not on. Uh, <laughs> that's on, otherwise I wouldn't be making that kind of noise. Let's turn it up here so it's... Okay, how's that? 
Okay. okay. It was going down. Huh. Well, you know, I can feel a lot of uh, guilt and tenseness in this area here. Okay, that's a good starting point. So the question first was, can I speak a little bit more about deconstructing feelings? And I asked him to uh, be a little more specific. And now you say that you're feeling guilt and tension. Is that correct? Yeah, and, uh, you know, welling up in the midsection area. Okay, may I ask your name? Bob. Bob, thank you. So notice that... Guilt is a concept, it's an idea. And there's a definition, we could discuss the definition of guilt. And then feeling tense, that's an actual sensation. So we're gonna slow it down and look a bit, a bit more at what's happening inside of you. Where is the exact location of the tension? Here. Kind of the solar plexus. Yes. And is there a movement to it? Usually when it's intense, it's right in this area. Let's stay with what's right now. You know, even though you're, it's a familiar feeling, yes? Well, well, I'm here now, so I wrote down before that, that uh, to your first question, I was feeling grateful and thankful that mm -hmm. I was here. Uh, but when I leave here, you know, I want to know a little bit more about how to deconstruct that feeling Beautiful, Bob. that I felt before I got oh, Okay, in. okay. So now we start to uncover the desire. The desire is that while here, Bob's feeling grateful and good, but there's that fear, that dread of leaving that we all feel, that feeling of, but what's going to happen after, you know, I leave this safe environment where we're all focused on um, inner peace. <laughs> So first notice that the mind is jumping ahead. The thoughts are saying, but what next? I won't continue to feel good. And those are fear thoughts, and that's how they get you. Slowing down is one way to deconstruct, to notice the thought. As John was saying, it's crucial to notice. Until we become conscious, we don't even know this is happening. Notice that I'm futurizing. That's the word that came to me. I'm futurizing. I'm jumping into the future. And then let me come back to what I'm feeling, locate it in my body, and place my hand on it for some loving support. Then I would actually just breathe through without really knowing how, because sometimes when I'm anxious, and many people, the breath becomes constricted. But just allow yourself to breathe through. Because normally, we move our attention away from any kind of uh, anxiety or tension or inner pressure. Can you feel the warmth of your hand on your solar plexus? Yes. yes. And is that warmth a bit comforting? Well, I'm conscious of it now. I wasn't before you said that. So thank you. Keeping it slow. You see, we don't even notice the warmth of our own palm. You know, Bob's experience is very typical. So we would need to become aware, wow, I am actually supporting myself. My palm has living heat in it. And that heat is melting you away. That's the deconstruction. Muji says it's like we're ice cubes in a glass of warm water. When we reach a certain point of ripeness and we're ready to be de deconstructed, so just slowing down that much, Bob, if you can catch my thoughts jumped into the future, where am I feeling something, put your hand on that spot and allow yourself to feel your hand. <laughs> Thank you. Great question. Thank you. Um, I think Billy wanted to be next. Oh, yeah, Billy was next. Was and, was then we'll a... okay. and then we'll come to Nancy. Yes. Hello. Uh, first, I want to start off with, uh, I think Amy has known John at least nine, ten years, because I, I met Amy in yoga like eight or nine years ago. I was driving home with her from the beach, and she's listening to this tape, and I said, who is this guy? And she said, it's John Mundy. <laughs> <laughs> so she said she just came back from California. You saw him in California. That was eight or nine years ago. Anyway, that's... 
that, that was one thing. And the thing you're talking about, how girls, you know, have to try to control their emotions, you know, hold it in. There was three boys and we had a sister. So my mother would be screaming, walking, hold it in. So my sister's like, you stand for, for guys, you're like, is that what you got to do? Because guys don't have to do that. In other words, <laughs> she kind of like going up and down, she just hard to do, you know. <laughs> So, I, I'm making it quick here. <laughs> because you talk about control of the smile. Like, I, my sons get out of the car one day and he says to me, Dad, you ever realize you have that stupid grin on your face? <laughs> and as I'm getting out of the car, I'm thinking about it. I guess I do, but I don't know where it's coming from, like you said. So, like, last night I woke up, like, at 2 o'clock in the morning. This is my last one. I'll leave it. And... <laughs> There was a documentary about the Trade Center. And I realized that's the only thing that was on. You know, what I'm trying to say, it's the biggest thing that happened here, but yet it's the least told about, you know? And I'm looking at, at the struggle of the eagle because on another channel was the Housewives of New York City, you know? So I'm going back and forth. I'm going from sad to want to know who's messing around with who in the house. <laughs> I'm looking at the struggle of the eagle, you know? So this is what mainly I, what I had to say. The eagle loves drama, right? Yes. Good or bad. That's fine. Yes, and tell your son that that mm. stupid smile is God. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, can we have your mic? Unfortunately, I need this one. So uh, over here for uh, Nancy. Can you pass it back to me, Nancy? Yes. Thank you. No, you gotta push the button. <coughs> the little red light come on. Okay, do I have to hold it? Yes. You no, you don't have to hold it. Oh, okay. Okay. But you gotta talk right into it. Can you hear me? No, you don't have a button push. Okay. Yeah, you're gone. Okay. okay. Let's just leave it on. Don't turn it off when okay. you hand it, all right? Okay. Um, so here's a question for you, Amy. Um, you talked about um, it's a paradox that when you're able to connect with what you're feeling in your body makes it possible for you to disidentify with your body and your ego more. So that's a paradox. And I want to, do you know what that mechanism is? Like why that is or how that happens? I guess I could say that the Course talk, talks about how the ego reverses everything. And I have found that the question, why, is a wild goose chase. Okay. Why is a wild goose chase? It really doesn't matter why. For me, what and how are more useful. And then I learned I don't know, have, have to know how. I don't need to know how. So what, what do I do? This disidentification usually happens slowly. First, I strengthened my identification with my body. First, similar to Bob, I'd put my hand on a spot and I wouldn't feel my own hand. It's this odd contradiction of I'm identified with the body and I'm not even in touch with my own body. So first we need to get in touch with the body and then oddly, paradoxically, eventually we disidentify from the body. Okay. So it's a mystery. I mean, yes, the specifics of I, it. I would say that it's a mystery. Okay. It might come to you in your work. Something might come with clarity that you find valuable and that you could explain. Yeah. Um, for me, the main thing is the shift in perception, which is how the Course defines a miracle, from identifying as a person to moving to presence. Muji says from person to presence. Muji says all the stories are not the problem. The person is the problem. Just believing you're the person. Believing you got stories. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Wow. Thank you. Thank right. you. Okay. Uh, actually, okay. And then stop. You want to stop, Rob? Hi, Amy. Veronica. Um, Hi, Veronica. I just happened to come across Muji about like two months ago. It just appeared on my YouTube and. Um, right. Right in your mouth, huh? It's on. Like just kiss. Okay. Right. Like so, um, yeah, I learned ice cream about cone. him about two months ago, and I started doing his meditation. So awesome! Can you please tell me a little bit more about your experience with Moji? 
Yes. And I, you said something about that he had gotten to you to the point where you kind of flatlined, where like ego was gone. My question to you is, how long did you stay that way? Okay. So Veronica's asking about um, my experience with Muji, who is a, a master and he's alive and what I would call an embodied master. Um, he, he's very well known. You can just go to YouTube and type in M-O-O-J-I and there are countless Muji videos. And if you resonate with him, you'll just gobble him up. He'll, you know, he, um, he's enlightened. He's disidentified as a person and yet He's, he's just universally warm and humane, and um, he has an ashram in Portugal. I feel that my disembodied master, Jesus, led me to an embodied master, and one might say it's because I just, you know, wasn't going all the way with the course, so he gave me a, a living teacher. Though Muji would say he's not a teacher, he is just pointing at the obvious. And he says, the obvious is not obvious until it becomes obvious. <laughs> he, says, he says he's holding up a mirror to us. He's just pointing and saying, just look. Here you are. Here you are. And yet, for some reason, we don't see. So uh, I've gone to see Muji several times in Portugal, um, in London. And um, once in a while, he comes to New York. He travels the world. But this amazing ashram has sprung up around him in Portugal. The, the beauty of this place, it is the Garden of Eden. And if you volunteer to do uh, karma yoga, you might be able to go there, or you can attend a retreat, you know, just look him up. My experience of Muji, I did get to interview him. It was the greatest blessing of my life. And uh, the video is on YouTube and maybe on Muji's website as well. It's called Thunderbolts of Truth. And in that video, we discuss A Course in Miracles, and he, he offers blessings to Course students. I wanted Course students to understand that this teaching does not stop at the level of a person. I just felt like Course students weren't getting it, that it's about the mind, and the mind is not the person. And what I told Veronica was that partially what I experienced in Muji's presence was what I call a flatlining of the mind. So if you think of a hospital monitor, you know, and you're hoping the person stays alive, you don't want to see them flatline. Uh, but then the line comes zzzz. Well, it felt like the thinking mind, the ego chatter, the yenta, <laughs> um, just, just, went flat. So the body is still there. The body is still there. But the identity is not absorbed in the body. The body becomes like a neutral vehicle, like your car. And there's a, you know, there's a natural inclination to take care of your car, to maintenance it. And yet, the car is no longer the main priority or the main focus. It's just that the car is uh, that which the consciousness moves through in this incarnation. And then there's the pull of identity, you know, and many, many times, you know, feeling right back in full-blown Amy. And yet the greater magnetism of just, uh, just being guided. So... It's a little tough to put words to it, and it's different for everybody. Everybody has different experiences in the presence of a master. Thanks for the question. Um, Shanti and I were talking, driving down in the car today. Shanti was talking about, and I've said here before, as, as you do the, the Course in Miracles, it, it's, it's a deep study, and the, the deeper you go, the more you do it, you really will find that this awareness, this, it just very gradually continues to expand and expand and expand. So that you, you just don't find yourself doing silly, stupid, unconscious kind of things anymore. I mean, that's the nicest part of it. That you just, the, the ego just sticks its head up <clears throat> less often, let's put it that way, right? And if it does, then you have more power to do something about it. You can let it go more quickly. You don't have to get caught up in thinking that somebody's... Uh, doing something against you, for example, because it doesn't make any difference even if they are. 
<laughs> There's nothing going on. Uh, stop. Proper. Hi. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you, Amy. Good to um, meet you. Same. So, um, you spent some time talking about the body and being, you know, in touch with the body. And I find for myself, I mean, that when I listen to my body too much, it's like me, it's just another example of me talking to myself and finding myself in myself. And the Course has taught me that's not really the place to look for the answers. And um, Can you give me an example? Well, well okay. Um, when you were speaking about it, just a little while ago, I felt myself contracting. And, um, I mean, had it not been for the Course, I might have left it at that. You know, that, um, that you know, that only the, the Course is, you know, illustrated to me that whatever I'm feeling, contracting or angry, like anger is a good one, you know, to treat the anger like a special delivery envelope. What's in the envelope? You know, the anger is the envelope. And um, so, um, and even that doesn't go far enough, you know. Um, it's, um, so I mean, the, I mean, what I, what I, what I, I feel what I, what I was missing while I was contracting, listening to you, is because it all starts with, with the, the foundation for the Course is everything is love. That it's either an expression of love or a, or a cry for love. love. And um, so to just define, just narrow it down to that. So One, if, if you find yourself contracting when I'm speaking about something, then that tells you that fear is present. And if there's an avoidance of the fear which is present, then in a way it's just being repressed. And that's the last thing you want to do. You want to look at the fear or the contraction with the Holy Spirit. Because the Course says, let's look at what you made. Let's take a good look at it. Let's spread it out on the table, like taking apart a clock, and let's just look at all the pieces, and then find out what happens. Now, it's not for everybody that, that working with the body is going to be the way out. It's just one way. You know, just like the Course says, it's one of thousands of legitimate paths. Um, this method that I'm offering you is just one way. I find that it's uh, very effective for many people. And you might be surprised if we sat together and just went through a process that it's not exactly what maybe the mind is saying it is. You might want to catch the mind. Maybe the ego oh, is telling oh, you one thing. It's, you know? it's definitely, you know, um, an alarm of an alarm of sorts. You know, mm -hmm. to you know to let me know that you know if I'm perceiving discomfort, you know, perception is projection. You know, and to know that to go deeper. And, and, but the beauty of it for me, I just came across, I mean, I was reminded of this from, from chapter 12, um, where it says, um, only appreciation is an appropriate response to your brother. Gratitude is due him for both his loving thoughts and his appeals for help, for both are capable of bringing love into your awareness if you perceive them truly. And all your sense of strain comes from your attempt. Not to do just this. Read the last line, and all your sense and of strain. And all your sense of strain comes from your attempts not to do just this. Not to do just this. Yes. But what do you do if you don't feel appreciative, and you can't force yourself to be appreciative? Where to go? Oh, choose again. How? How? Pause. Um, I mean, I, I'm... I've come along far enough that, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I don't have it down enough to know it in real time, <laughs> when, but I'll know that, I, to know that I'm missing it, but I can know that I'm missing it, <laughs> you know, <laughs> so, you know um, But if you know that you're missing it, see, this is great, I, I appreciate you just uh, tossing the ball back and forth, uh -huh. then who is the you? Who knows that you're missing it because the Holy Spirit doesn't know that you're missing it because the Holy Spirit is only regarding us as light and only experiencing as, us as as itself which is just this emanating radiant light so anything that knows that we're missing it can't be it and how do we solve the problem at the level of the problem oh that's well what was spoken before nothing happens outside of me 
Who is you? Well, it's not who I think I am. Correct. <laughs> it's not yeah. the guy holding the microphone. Right. I know that. Yes. Yeah. 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 So, you know, these are more like Zen Kong questions. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't mean to put you on the spot. You know, it's you. Fine. No, it's, it's fine. It's helping yeah. me, you know, elucidate it more yeah. myself. But, um, you know, but, you know, just the early, you know, the early lessons and maybe the, might, might be the second lesson. You, you're not angry for the, rethink, for the reasons you think you are. Fifth, yeah. The fifth you were never upset for the reason you think. Yeah, I didn't like that the first time I read it. <laughs> <laughs> I've come to lo- I've come to love it, but in the first yeah. time, the first time I, I read that, I did not like it. So, but yeah, but I, I, I mean, that's where the practice comes in. I mean, lesson five doesn't always come to me instantly, but sometimes it does. Yes. You know, and um, I. Um, it's um, you know, and, it, and it, you know, it's just, and the and the and the big joke of it all is when, w- w- because the ego is really a creative force that comes up in it, in, it, in one way or another. It'll fi- always find another way. Where what kind of force? And a, it's almost like a force of creativity. The ego is so creative in finding a new way. Miscreative. Uh, yeah, miscreative. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Manipulative might be a good word. Yeah, yeah. Once. Um, on the street, somebody beat me up once, and um, and I was just—it was just remarkable how, I mean, all the ingredients were there that feel like a victim, yeah. and none of that happened, and I felt so remarkable. Wow, you know, this is great. Only to, like you know, about six months later, something very mundane happened in an impersonal interaction, and I lost my shit altogether. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. and you know, and it and it stunned me. Like you know, I couldn't believe. Yeah. You know, that, oh, I thought I came so far. You know, only to be reminded, you know, so... You know, the ego has brainwashed us, and the course is a mind training. Mm-hmm. And I'm just, it's just my way, my individualized curriculum, to access the body, to undo the body. Yet, as you say, sometimes, as, as John says, when you get deeper and deeper into the course and you've been doing it for a while, there are these shifts in perception where there can just be the, I'm never upset for the reason I think, Shh, and you're out of it. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. I want to acknowledge that. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. On my good days. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Thank you, too. Anybody else? On Lynn? Hi. What a great day this turns out to be. Uh, I like, I like uh, being in touch with the body. I'm very much into yoga. I'm very much, I have to keep moving. But uh, it, it, I'm, this is just an observation. When you said write down the feelings, I wrote I am, and I wanted to put angry, and then I said, no, I shouldn't put this. You know, I shouldn't put I'm angry. I'm, I'm happy here, you know, but I, I've been looking at, at anger, my anger, and it's never justified, but it's there. It's, you know, it's a lot. It's a, and I think it's in everybody. I don't think there's anyone who doesn't have it. And then I say, well, maybe it's fear. Anger is fear. And uh, yeah, I definitely have that too. And the funny part, I felt it here. I felt it at the top of my head. Yeah. And I'm thinking, is that my seventh chakra? Yeah. Uh, is it trying to get out and it's stuck? You know, I just, uh, yeah. Well, uh, just to speak to that a little bit, I do believe that the tingling at the seventh chakra was was your crown chakra kind of uh, opening or expanding. And that's just yoga talk. You know, it's a, a system of chakras and energy and things. And so it's just one way of looking at things. Um, saying I am is a very potent statement. You know, Muji makes it very clear that all of us share an identity, I am, before we ever uh, contract into the personal identity. That there's just a feeling of being alive when you're born into a body, before you know your name, when you're an infant, there's just that sense, I am. And if you're in a coma or, or if you have amnesia and you forget all of your statistics, you still know, I am. So I do prefer to say when feelings come up, I feel. Mm-hmm. I feel angry, I feel ashamed, I feel afraid, um, as opposed to I am. Because you're correct, at the, at the heart of everything, I am happy. That is there always for all of us. I am peaceful. I am free. 
I am life. I am the unborn. And to say those statements and allow yourself to feel into the truth of them, rather than to kind of force them on yourself as an affirmation that you don't really believe, is very powerful. So, yes, the Course tells us everybody is angry. You know, as an ego, as a person, that's kind of the, the juice that's keeping everything running. You know, fear is like an umbrella, and under that is guilt, anger, um, you know, hate, um, things like that. And, and under the umbrella of love is joy, peace, um, harmony, beauty. Yeah. Well, I think you, you should also find, though, as you do this, that there's less of it. You know, I mean, that you really do begin to get free. I'm not saying you're 100% free, but uh, you're, you're less likely to be stimulated into anger. Well, what you said a little while ago about right. that, your reactivity lessens and that the amount of time that anger might last is less and that... All that, right. All of that, yeah. Right. I, I, my sense is that the anger is the same, full force, murderous rage, because that's the ego thought system. So even if we're feeling it as the merest hint of irritation, it's still... Anger is anger. And all that is is information that, okay, uh, I've identified with ego, yet that, that shift, that quick shift into, but I'm not interested in it. I'm not attached exactly. to it. I'm not right. fueling it. You just don't need it. I mean, enough already. Hmm? <laughs> enough already. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> why continue to breed that sort of thing? You know, that's why the, one of the quotes earlier was, you know, I'm not, don't amplify error. You know, let it, you really can let it go, quickly, even. As you, you get quicker and quicker, as you get more deeply involved in this. Here. I think the, the less personal you become in your experience of this, you go from I'm angry to I feel angry to there is anger. And there is anger but I don't have to identify with it. It's certainly not me, and even I get tired of feeling it, like you're saying, and then it's just, there's anger, and then next moment, there's no anger. I love it, Michael. Beautiful, beautifully said. Well, this goes along with um, the anger. Um, healing the terrorist within is... Um, I mean, terrorism is just basically wanting the world to go your way, wanting to get your way. And God knows I've got that. And when I think of it that way, then I am a terrorist. And I, it's, you know, the, it talks about the level of confusion that, that, and what you just said, or John just said, you know, the tiniest upset is the greatest upset also, it's all the same thing. So when I want things to go my way, that is my terrorist within. And the, the name of the day is, you know, healing that error, that error of thought that I've got, that things that I know, what's, that I know, period, anything. That I, and when, and when I don't get my way, then I'm angry. And I, and however I express that, whether it's flying a plane into a building or just having a, a, a terrible thought about a family member. I mean, it's all terrorism. And I am the terrorist and I am the victim at the same time. Mm -hmm. Where this is leading us, though, is that you don't have to have your way. I, I don't have to have my way. No, but that's the that's... error. Right. Thinking that I have to have Thinking my way. that you have to have yeah. it, right. There's the, that's the error that needs to be healed in me. One of, one of my favorite quotes, and look, one of the quotes that I quote probably more often than any is, let him be what he is, seek not to make of love an enemy. And just let her, let it, let the situation be. And I don't have to go to that. I don't have to go to terror or anger or upset or attack or any of that sort of stuff. I should actually be learning that none, that's all nonsense. And I... Where this is ultimately going, it's going all the way home. It's going all the way to enlightenment. So if I'm on my way home, I'm dropping junk off along the, the road. And, uh, you know, pur pure purgation or purification of that kind of stuff is, is crucial to doing this kind of work. Right. 
Beverly, and then we're going to stop, or I think, well, okay. I think I had my first personal experience with what we're talking about today. Someone made a mistake with an appointment that we had. I had a confirmation of the appointment, and yet when I got there, he said, you were here at the wrong time. And I said, but I got an email from you. He said, this is not an argument. And my old self would have flared. And what do you mean it's not an argument? I have an email from you. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, show me the email. And I said, you know what? This is not worth my peace at the moment to myself. I didn't say it out loud. And when I got home, I wrote an email to this person. And I said, you know, I think I just got a 20-pound weight off my shoulder. And it feels very good. Wow. Um, just a couple of announcements because we're go Amy's going to end with a meditation but just a couple of announcements do you want to make your little announcement real quick because we're going to end here in a few minutes do you want to say something there is not going to be a later <laughs> it's now or never oh, okay Okay. On a practical level uh, as well, uh, usually after class, uh, those who would like to join us, we go out to uh, dinner at uh, the Saigon Market. It is two blocks exactly to the right on 12th Street and then to the left on University Place, and it's right there. And you'll get there before I do and for some of the rest of us do. If you want to go, just say you're with the Miracles Group. And, well, there's a big table in the back of the room for us, okay? Billy, you want to get the last word here? I was glad I came here yesterday because Kazuko had a film yesterday about a boy that was five years old that lost his arms. You know, and the lady that taught him lost her arms, too, because her, fa her father found out that his nephew ran off with his wife and went into a rage and cut her arms off. And, uh, in other words, she didn't hate her father. She, the anger you're talking about, she, she said it was her fault. But it's a movie that toward, if Kasuko can show everybody, was, it's a lot to do with the cross of miracles. I see a lot in there, you know? I just had to say that. Yeah. Yes. Yes. She actually said to hate my stepfather would be to hate myself. She just had that inner wisdom. Just didn't go there. So somewhere in the text, there's a line that says uh, something like, reality only comes to an unclouded mind. And the workbook lesson 69 actually has a, a meditation in it that moves us through the clouds so we have an unclouded mind. So I just like to kind of adapt a few paragraphs from that as the meditation today. So this is Jesus speaking to you. Very quietly now, with your eyes closed, try to let go of all the content that generally occupies your consciousness. Think of your mind as a vast circle surrounded by a layer of heavy, dark clouds. You can only see the clouds because you seem to be standing outside the circle and quite apart from it. From where you stand, you can see no reason to believe there is a brilliant light hidden by these clouds. The clouds seem to be the only reality. They seem to be all there is to see. Therefore, you do not attempt to go through them and pass them, which is the only way in which you would be really convinced of their lack of substance. Now, we will make this attempt to move through this vapor. 
settle down in perfect stillness, allowing yourself to know how much you want to reach the light in you right now. Determine to go past the clouds. Reach out and touch these clouds in your mind. Brush them aside with your hand. Feel them resting on your cheeks and forehead and eyelids as you go through them. Go on. Clouds cannot stop you. You cannot fail because your will is your Father's will. Let the power of God work in you and through you. What you undertake with God must succeed. Begin to feel a sense of being lifted up and carried. Your little effort and small determination call on the power of the universe to help you and God himself raises you from darkness into light. Thank you, Amy. Appreciate you being with us today. Thank you. Yeah. So remember the next time we are on the third Sunday, not the second, so it's the 16th of uh, October. If you live anywhere near northern New Jersey, I will be in northern New Jersey on the 9th of October. And uh, we'll see you then. If you want to come with us to dinner, why come with us to dinner? All right. Thank you.